Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. We've been in a series called Life, Light, and Love as we kind of march through um, the letter or the book 1 John. 1 John was written by the Apostle John. He's the last living apostle when he writes this letter. Um, and, and he writes it in, in a way that makes sense for someone that's, well, older. Uh, he would have been probably in his 80s at this point. All his friends that were apostles, that were the disciples, um, had passed away by now. He's the, he's the last apostle. The, 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 Jesus had his disciples. They were called apostles later on as those that walked with Jesus tightly. And at this point, he's the last one. So he speaks with apostolic authority. And a little bit of how your grandpa might speak now that he's old. Do you ever meet somebody that's, that's um, a little bit further along in life, more experienced and has wisdom? If you're old in the room, don't uh, take offense at this. Um, <clears throat> it's too late, isn't it? Uh, but they seem to be a little bit more cut and dry because they're like, hey, I, I've done all the fluff my whole life. I'm done. What are you going to do now? I, I've already pleased everybody I'm going to please. <laughs> like, I'm kind of at this point where I just say what needs to be said because I only have so much longer to say this. And so what we find with John as he writes these letters is kind of a tone like that. As, as the last uh, living apostle, he's writing this letter to the churches then and to the church even now, and we'll see that today. Um, and, and so you'll understand that the tone is very firm and uh, also very loving, much like a grandpa, right? So he's going to tell you how it is and then love on you and give you a hug and a cookie or something. Your grandpa didn't do that? I got cookies. Actually, I got a dollar bill every time I saw him. Yeah, right? It's a great way to bribe love um, from a grandson. Um, so, so what we're going to see here is that, is that a, a pastoral loving heart and a very firm tone to what he has to say. And so um, he, he's going to say things like, it's either life or it's death. It's either light or it's darkness. It's either love or it's hate. Today we're going to see that he'll say it's either a, a spirit of truth or a falsehood. So if you're taking notes, you might want to call today's message um, Spirit Test. Spirit Test. How many people like tests? No one. That's what I thought. Um, how many like tests a little bit better when they're true or false? Because now i got a chance, right? Um, so if you're taking notes, just Spirit Test, true or false? True or false? So what I'd like to do is, is read through. We're only going to go, going to go through six verses uh, in First John today. It's First John chapter 4. Verse 1 through 6. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read them straight through. I'm going to pray for us. And then we'll spend the rest of our time unpacking uh, what these six verses mean uh, in that day and then today to us. And so um, let's read this. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice hurts a little bit. I was, uh, I was getting it during worship in that last song and hurt my voice a little bit. <laughs> Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Spirit tests true or false. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, it's only by your grace that we get to gather and hear more about you, that we get to crack open your word. And God, I just pray that your word, it's alive and it's active. And I pray that it, it goes down to the deep parts of every single one of us. God, I thank you that your presence is here because you promised it and you're faithful. 
I think that we get to sing worship uh, songs and praises to your name. And, and God, I just pray that wherever we're at today, God, you meet every single individual where they're at today. God, whether a, it's a veteran in this walk with you or someone maybe today for the first time hearing of your goodness and the gospel of Jesus Christ, God, that you would reveal yourself and draw us to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's some uh, very cool things about going straight through Scripture like we're doing right now. Um, one of the things it does is it forces us to look at Scriptures that maybe we haven't had unpacked for us before, or, or maybe we haven't camped on very long before. We've kind of breezed through in the Bible. Um, and it makes sure that we have the full counsel of Scripture. I say that every week as we go through this because I think it's good for us to know that the Bible is not for cherry-picking verses. The Bible is not like, oh, I really need something to make me, uh, to fit how I want to do my life. And let me just see if I can manipulate these couple verses I can find and, and make them kind of make me feel good about what I want to do. The Bible is the word of God. It should be held um, in high regard and, and that we should read all of it because context is a big deal. Context is a big deal. You ever seen an interview on TV um, or, or maybe a, a piece of an interview on TV, and you have a viewpoint that, that, that grows really fast because of what was given to you, the clip that was given to you from that interview. I mean, we're like towards a political season now, so it happens every day. And you get some sort of emotions, you get some sort of viewpoint, and then if you actually went back and found the whole interview and watched the whole thing, you might feel different. You might view things different. You might, you might feel the same. But at least then you have the full context of what's going on. And scripture is the same way. What we should do is we should understand that um, when we read a scripture, we should see where it fits in scripture. We should look at the verses before and the verses after. We should look at the chapters before and after. We should look at the whole book that it's in. We should look at the whole New Testament or Old Testament and, and then all of scripture and see like, okay, how does this fit with the word of God? And what is God saying um, over the whole thing here? And how does this one verse fit into what God's story is? Because sometimes what can happen is we'll, we'll pick and choose um, and we're missing what God was really saying because we don't see it in its context. And so one of the cool things, like I said, about going straight through a book like this is hopefully by the grace of God, everything is, it, well, it is where it is. And so we'll just kind of um, go through it that way. Here we go. Let's unpack this. The first three verses we're going to unpack together says this. Dear friends, your Bible might say, Beloved. Beloved, dear friends, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every spirit. Um, it's kind of not only in a future idea, future tense, but it's also right now. Stop believing everything that you're told. Um, when it says every spirit, can we close those doors? We got usher that close those doors. I'm sorry, I just love the kids out there, um, but they're just loud. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. That kind of sounds interesting, right? Do not believe every spirit. When's the last time you felt like, man, a spirit just said something to me, and I need to test and see what it said, if it's true or not? Most times we don't. Because when we hear test the spirits or not believe every spirit, we, we can easily get into a place of like, what do you mean? Is there, are there spirits just speaking to me all the time? What does that look like? Um, we need to realize that uh, all teachings and belief systems um, have spiritual background to them. That, that what we hear from viewpoints and teachings uh, come from different places on a spiritual level first, on a supernatural level first, before the rubber ever hits the road. Okay. Uh, we're, we're at church. God is real. There's a spiritual realm. Um, not just from like the creepy way that you see on TV sometimes. But, but there's, there's really good and evil. Um, and, and that there really is Jesus Christ. And what we'll see today it calls the Antichrist or those against Jesus on a spiritual level that would push forth messages either for Jesus or against Jesus. So that we should not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. What's a false prophet? A prophet is a mouthpiece. 
It's a messenger from God. Um, see them all through the Bible where, where God speaks through a, a, a person um, to his people. And that God would use them as a mouthpiece or a messenger to deliver his word. And what they're saying here is that there's false prophets. That means that they're, uh, they go under the title of prophet or they act as if they speak for God. But in all actuality, it's false and it's fake and it's not true. And he says that they've gone out into the world. Uh, this is how, this is awesome. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges or confesses that Jesus Christ, and, and Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Christ is the anointed. It's Messiah. It's a title. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That Jesus is real. That Jesus really came. That the, the Messiah has come to earth. And John starts off this letter, and I'm not going to go through it all right now, but in the first week, if you want to go back and listen to it, it's online. Um, the first four verses is him saying, Jesus is real. We witnessed it. We were there. And as the last living apostle, like he really is saying, like I slept in the same room with Jesus. Like I, I walked with Jesus. We ate together. We spent time together. For three years, we were side by side all the time, except for when Jesus went out and prayed by himself. Mostly they're with him. And so he says, Jesus is real. I touched him. I ate together. He's, he, he, he came. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. Um, as a witness, he speaks. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Every spirit that does not acknowledge or confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is common even now is already in the world. Um, I taught on the Antichrist, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist in depth um, a handful of weeks back. Um, 1 John 2, 18 through 27. So again, I'm not going to stay there a long time right now, but Antichrist is against Christ. What's really being said here is that there's the Holy Spirit that pushes forth the message of truth that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That Jesus is real. That's a big deal because Jesus had to really die for our sins. And so he says that Jesus Christ really came in the flesh and that the other side doesn't acknowledge that Jesus is from God. The other side doesn't acknowledge Jesus as who Jesus is. Now, most everybody in the world today will acknowledge that Jesus, a guy named Jesus, 2,000 years ago, um, walked on the earth. In fact, most other religions have had to at least account for this Jesus character. And they'll either call him a prophet or a good man or one of the gods or there's all these different views and different viewpoints. And what John is nailing down is that those that acknowledge or confess that Jesus is who Jesus is, Christ, the Messiah, it is those that come with the spirit of God. It's the message of God for us. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. I want to unpack this for a little bit. Really the way you can tell um, if, if God is being declared clearly and accurately is, and the spirit behind a message that someone is bringing is who do they say Jesus is? Who do they say Jesus is? Hmm. Or maybe It'd be more accurate to say, who do they confess Jesus as? Who do they acknowledge Jesus as? You know, there's lots of um, messages that go out uh, regularly under the title of Christianity. Um, and not all of them make much of Christ like God does. And sometimes, even though under the umbrella of Christianity, it's not really the Christian message. Um, so I hope today will help us to see kind of the, the, the true and the false. That there's a spirit test and that we should test everything that we hear through a, a, a lens, through a filter of the Holy Spirit and God's word. And that we would see more clearly today what is true and we would stand for that and what is false and we wouldn't be deceived by that. Huh. I can tell you guys are excited. Who do we say Jesus is? Who do we confess Jesus as? Number one, 
uh, fully God and fully man. Fully God and fully man. Fully God and fully man. People can lean one way or the other sometimes and, and not really want to accept that, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Well, if he's not fully God, um, then, then you're denying the deity of Christ and really the ability for him to die for your sins. Also, um, if he's not fully man in, in, in the flesh, um, then he didn't really die for our sins. And, and so therefore, either way we're in trouble and still in our sins. Either way, if Jesus isn't fully God or fully man, um, then we're still where we were to start with. We need him to be who he really is. For us to have a right relationship with God, reconciled through Christ. Huh? Look at this in Colossians 2, 6 through 10. 6 is awesome, that's why I have it in here, but really it'll get to the point further down. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in your faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Now watch this, He's, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Or your Bible might say on human tradition and the basic principles of this world instead of on Christ. Hmm. That's what John is talking about. He's saying don't be taken away by the viewpoints of this world, but be focused on and understand who Jesus really is and put your hope, your faith, and your belief system in Jesus. That there are people that, that come at you with hollow or empty and deceptive philosophy. To deceive means to bring a partial truth. Usually deception is not an outright lie because an outright lie we would identify instantly. But, but deception is the truth with a twist. That, that's the devil in, in the garden saying, did God really say that? Okay, so, so God did talk to you. Okay, I'll give you that, but are you, are you sure? And trying to, to, to twist the truths that are already there. Or even Jesus, when he's being tempted um, to, to have, you know, that Satan quotes scripture to Jesus. But he uses it deceptively and twists it to try to make it say what he wants it to say. And Jesus, because he's Jesus, um, puts it back in his face. But, but that oftentimes that there's hollow and empty, deceptive philosophies in the world based on its basic principles um, that would pull us from Jesus and the supremacy of Christ. Okay. Listen to this. For in Christ, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives, fully God, in bodily form, fully man. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness, he is the head over every power and authority. Uh, so, so let's just look at this. Every message that doesn't put Jesus at the top, the head over everything, um, it is not the, the clear, true gospel that acknowledges Jesus and the supremacy of Christ. Okay. I'm going to get ahead of myself in my notes because I'm so excited at where we're going here. Breathe, Russ. <laughs> Who do they say Jesus is? Confess, acknowledge Jesus as he's fully God and fully man above everything. Above everything. Listen to this. Um, who do they say Jesus is or confess Jesus as, acknowledge Jesus as? Lord. Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says this. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Now, obviously, you can say any given thing. Our tongues are wicked. You could say any given thing at any given moment. But it's saying to confess, to acknowledge, to believe, uh, to declare from a deep place that Jesus is Lord. It is impossible to do without the Holy Spirit living inside of us. It is impossible. Without the Holy Spirit moving us to say that, we will not say it. And the cool thing about that is that that means that everything we boast about in our salvation is boasting about God and his amazing work in us. So that we can't go like, oh man, I'm better than that guy because I figured it out and he didn't. But instead we just go, thank you, God. Thank you. 
that you moved in a way and, and revealed to me uh, the goodness of Jesus Christ and the fact that I can be made pure, whole, and righteous through Christ and, and, and be right with God for eternity. Huh. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Maybe you've heard this before if you came up in church. If you declare with your mouth or confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Lord. Not some guy, not some prophet, not, not some do-gooder. Now, was he a prophet and did he do good? Of course. But he's Lord. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. That's not a one-time decision. That's, that's a, a belief system and, and a confessing with our mouth that, that, that is who we are now. That Jesus is Lord. It's not a one-time back room, kind of hide, confess with a little buddy, Jesus is Lord, and now just pretend like that never happened. It, it's a transformation. In fact, to say Jesus is Lord and to really believe it is saying, Jesus, you're the king of my life, not me. Lordship is control. That you would say, okay, God, um, I've tried my way. Uh, my way got me here. Um, I, I realize that you are the creator. You're above everything. In fact, you know how everything is, is built because you built it. And, and God, I'm submitting my life to you. I trust in you. In fact, I'm putting my faith and hope in Jesus Christ, what he's done in my place and what he will continue to do in me. Hmm. Listen to this in 2 Peter chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of the truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. <clears throat> you know one of the um, easiest ways we can get deceived into following something other than God that comes under the umbrella of God is we all long to have a tight relationship with God. Now, whether we actually act on that or not, I, we'll see. But, but God built us to have a relationship with him. He put eternity in our hearts that we would long for more than what this world has to offer. And, and, and in that, you know that. You, you've had successes and you've had failures and you've worked through things and thought there's got to be more than this. And there is. God put that in you so that you would eventually realize that he's the only one that can fill that place. That you're built for him. To walk in him and with him in relationship. And one of the ways that, that we can be deceived is because we long for that, we long for, for people to help us understand how to do that. Sometimes we can forget that all of us that have put our faith in Jesus have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And that at least right now, where we live, all of us have access to the Word of God. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. That, that we have that. that. That we can understand who God is. That we can have a relationship with God. That we can speak to God. That you don't come here and go like, I better hear what God's saying. Because only Pastor Russ has a relationship with God. And then he tells us what to do. That's not the case. Please, I'll quit. But then my hope would be that I spur you on in your relationship with Jesus, not mine. They spur you on in your relationship with Jesus. And one of the ways that we can get deceived is that there, there are people, and it says it right here, that they exploit you with fabricated stories. There are people that will say, like, God told me, or I had the experience with God. And, and listen, there are God experiences, and God does tell people things sometimes. But let me tell you something. Every single time, it's in alignment with his word. So he does that. 
praise God. You should ask God to talk to you in that kind of way. And then you should go back to the Bible and make sure it was God talking. But oftentimes what happens, instead of filtering what we hear, we hear somebody say, well, God told me, and this is kind of the thing, and they'll start declaring what God told them, but it doesn't necessarily have um, a foundation in the Bible. And because we maybe don't go check that and make sure that what, what they're saying is true, we can be deceived and we can get off track really fast. And so we can just kind of look for all these different spiritual voices out there in the world and and. and a lot, a lot of it is pastors or just people that we look up to um, because of their closeness in relationship to Jesus or so it seems. And, and we can, because of the stories that someone can tell, sometimes um, look to them like they have it all figured out more than you because they have more stories. Okay. And so we can see somebody on TV. We can see a little snippet that's put out over social media. And we can grab on to that as truth without ever making sure that it's truth. And so John says, test the spirits. Test them. Run them up against the tests. Is Jesus the most important thing being communicated here? Is it that Jesus is our hope, our trust, where we put our faith? Is it that he is Lord over everything? Because, well, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Fully God and fully man. He's Lord. And the next point is over everything. Over everything. Everything. Not, not some things, not sometimes. That Jesus is above everything. The supremacy of Christ. I'm going to go ahead and get ahead of myself and then I'll come back to it. A relationship with Jesus, Christianity, has sometimes been sold as an add-on. It is not. It is a takeover. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is above everything. Fully God and fully man. Walked this earth in perfection. Perfection died in my place for my sins, yours too. All of them, all of them. And the guilt and the shame and the condemnation and the regret and, and, and all of that. He died for it as the only one that ever could. In my place for what was due me, absorbing the wrath due my sins out of love for me. And not only taking all of my sin and, and what is associated with sin or comes with sin, which is death, but giving me all of his righteousness, right standing with God, purity, wholeness, and, and, and life. It, listen, it's the great exchange. It only sounds great for us. That God would take all, all of our brokenness, all of our mistakes, all of our issues. And here's the great thing. Past, present, and future. Everything when we put our faith in the works of Jesus Christ and ask him to come be Lord of our lives. Huh. Over everything. It's not an add-on. It's a takeover. When I say takeover, we kind of feel some kind of way because we think of like a military forceful takeover. No, it's, it's us submitting our lives, asking God to take over. And the take over means he takes over everything. Okay, I don't know if you caught that. We have priorities in our life. When he takes over, he takes over. I'm, I'm going to take what's over everything. That's me. Over everything. And you know what? That's when things in our life start to come into alignment. If we think we can add Jesus in another place, we'll feel, you ever have your back out of whack and you needed to go to the chiropractor and, and there's like no peace for you until those things get back into alignment. That happens with our life a lot. We're like, Jesus, we want you to be, in our, we want you to be on our list because we know we should. But I would really like to be in control. Why don't I, go, why don't I be number one? Because I'm apparently a better God than you. 
And then I'll put some other things above that. And then, you know, I'll add you in because I do like how you take care of this, this, and this. I do like your views on five, six, and seven. So what happens is uh, we can live our life in that place and as Christians feel this unrest inside of us, this unsettling inside of us. And, and, And there is no peace for us. And the reason is we're out of alignment. We need to go to the chiropractor. We need things to be back in alignment, that, that, that Jesus would be Lord, that we would put him first, and that we would worship him. You know, worship is worth and value. It's, it's, it's to shape or build worth or value. That's the literal term of the word worship. It's like we worth sight is the word we get it from. Worth or value to shape or build. You know, God has a value that we can't change because he's above everything. He sits on the throne regardless if you like it or not. But an awesome thing happens when we acknowledge the place that God really is in our own lives. He's in the proper place and value in our life. We build and shape how we view God based on how we worship him. And if there's anything else we bow down to before we bow down to him, we have idols in our life. We actually trust things or self more than we trust a sovereign God that loves us. That's fun, huh? Over everything, over everything. Colossians 1, 15 through 23 says this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That doesn't mean he was actually created. That means that he's over everything. For in him all things were created, Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things are being created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. His resurrection is what we put our hope in. So that in everything, in everything, he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came to earth in the real flesh he had to or he wouldn't have shed blood on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, because of your evil behavior. I don't think we need to take a survey, but I think all of us would agree that we've done some evil behavior. But now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Okay, that's good news. Okay, right there. Let's stop. Sometimes we can feel like we're some kind of way with God. God, I made mistakes. I've done these issues. I've done the evil behaviors that he's talking about here. And I feel distant. I feel far. I feel dirty. Um, we need to remember, that if our faith is in Jesus, that that's already been taken care of. That doesn't mean that we don't uh, confess it and realize that we're made righteous and purified because of Jesus. We should confess it. Because well, confessing, uh, confessing, literally the word confess, it means to say the same thing as. So when we're confessing our sin, all we're really doing is saying, hey, God, you're right, that was sin. It's saying the same thing that God says. It, that, that was sin, and I give it to you. And the Bible says that he purifies us, that we're forgiven of our sins and purified from all unrighteousness. Don't we all long for that? Think of the peace in that. I need to preach faster. It's hot in here. I'm sweating in my elbow crease. I didn't know that was possible. Apparently, I stand like a T-Rex or something. I don't know why I'm, I need to just do this. <clears throat> Stay with me. Sorry. He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Listen, that Jesus is supreme over all things. 
And we do best when we have a proper view of that based in Scripture. That when we apply that to our lives and put Jesus really where he already is, it goes well for us. Because our best benefit is completely connected to God's most glory. And when God is glorified in our life, it's best for us. And that's awesome. Okay. The world would give us all kinds of other options for what would be over us, what should be supreme. Um, primarily, I won't get into all of them. So, sometimes they'll say that uh, really other ways or other gods, and he says these different spirits, the evil ones, the antichrist spirits. Um, sometimes people have good things that they put over God. So like family or friends or, or the works that we do or the culture around us, our feelings, that's a big one we put over God. Like, yeah, I know God says that, but doesn't he know how I feel? Aren't my feelings a, a higher authority? Shouldn't I decide things based on that? God gave you feelings. I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to your feelings, um, uh, but, but don't go by them. <laughs> You've been super angry, like you could punch a hole through somebody. Don't do it. It's, it, it's okay because sometimes anger comes up because we see something that's wrong, and, and so there's like a, a, a justice in us. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. It, it, it's, are you with me? Feelings. Um, and then the primary one that, that always gets pushed on us to have be above God in our lives is us. It's us. What's the biggest thing that gets in our way uh, of falling after Jesus with everything that we have? Me. That, that I want to make my decisions. I want to be my own God. And although I've seen that that doesn't go well, I still fight for it. Other options are given options um, by the world, but God is very clear. And that the Spirit of God would, would speak of Jesus, the teachers and teachings of, of God that come from God, speak of Jesus in an appropriate way, that he's fully God, fully man, Lord over everything. Let's keep moving. Greater in you, 1 John 4, 4 says this, you, dear children, are from God, that's awesome, and have overcome them. That's the false prophets and false teachers. What does that mean? That means that people are going out and they're bringing these false messages that aren't right about Jesus, or they're putting other things above Jesus, and that's really oftentimes what happens, um, that, that what can happen is we can say like, yeah, Jesus, 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 but what we're really um, pushing is you, you, you. And so it's easy to be like, Jesus is awesome, and the only reason Jesus came is because you're so awesome. In fact, if you listen close enough, you'll realize I mostly talk about how you're awesome. No. <laughs> Although I think you're really great. God's awesome. And we're in desperate need of him. And, and, and he's the one that should be glorified and put first in our life. And that's, again, that's good for us. Okay. Are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one who is in the world. Greater than the one who is in the world. The, the, the Holy Spirit inside of you is greater than whatever is pushing forth another message, which is evil spirits, or the Bible even says that the devil or Satan um, rules the kingdom of the air, that, that the one that's pushing forth messages in the world, that there really is evil and there really is Satan, and, and that he, he would want us not to uh, really understand who Jesus is in a saving, powerful kind of way. He that is in you, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Listen to this, just real quick. If you're taking notes, maybe the subpoint is peace and power. John 16, 33, this is Jesus. He says, I've told you these things so that in me, in me, in me, you may have peace. 
in Jesus. In Jesus, that's in a relationship with him. That's in him we find it. Not because we know about him intellectually. It's being in him. In me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. How many know that's awesome and like a bummer a little bit in there for a second? In me, you will have peace. We're like, yes. In this world, you will have trouble. Dang it. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's good news. That's awesome. And let me tell you what that l- lets you know, that the world is broken, and as long as we're in it, we'll still have trouble that comes against us. And I need you to know that because sometimes falsely people can put out there like, hey, let's give life to Jesus. It's just lollipops and walking on clouds, man. Everything's good. The world is still broken. Trouble will still come. But take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. And when we're in him, there is a peace. The Bible says that God can give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. That means the world can be falling apart around us or even coming against us. And that we would still be able to remain in peace because we're with Jesus and eternally we're good. Hmm. And then look at this. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Thank God for that. Because sometimes I'm weak and not very loving and not very disciplined. Then my weakness, he is strong. And the spirit that he's given us out of love for us is a spirit of love, of power of love and of self-discipline. And let's go to these last two verses so I can get you out of this sauna that we're sitting in. Remember where you're from. Remember where you're from. First John 4, 5, and 6. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. Hmm. You know what, uh, what's uh, popular isn't always the truth? And the truth isn't always popular. Kind of go hand in hand. The Bible's very clear that when we deliver truth, it should be done in grace. It should be done with the hopes of reconciliation. Not like a truth bulldozer. Just wipes out everything out in, it, in its path. That we deliver truth with grace and hopes of reconciliation. That people would turn and understand the goodness of God. Be reconciled to him. That God would use us as a tool for that. Maybe even against popular ways that we would Stand firm on Jesus and the truth. Hmm. They're from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. Can I tell you something? In the day we live in, um, there's lots of false prophets and false teachers um, that would even claim to be like the false prophets did, mouthpieces for God. Uh, In fact, in our day, it's not unique to our day. It's happened all the time. We're just seeing it a lot lately. Um, there are fundamental doctrines, fundamental understandings of who God is and what that means for his people, of what the Bible is very clear about, that there are are, are, um, people in positions of, I don't know, spiritual authority um, that are just throwing those by the wayside so that they will speak the popular statements so that more people will come um, agree with them and listen to what they have to say. That that it's just a, hey, you know what? Um, The message isn't as popular right now, so why don't I just change the message? We don't get that option. We're messengers of the word, not manipulators of the word. The goal is not to do origami on the pages of scripture. Right? Like, I swear it's a goose. Like, it's just to deliver it. 
my role as a pastor, as a preacher, is to give you the word. Hopefully by the grace of God, the spirit, the spirit of God will work through me and in us to bring even more clarity to the beauty of the word that he's given us. They're from the world, and if we speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. Listen, we are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood, true or false. We are from God. We're not of this world. In John 17, starting in verse 14, it says this. This is Jesus. He's actually praying to the Father. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You ever wanted to pray that prayer? Just real quick. You ever gone like, man, the world's so hard, and try, like living for Jesus can be difficult because the pushback um, that, God, why don't you just take me out of here? Um, Jesus, for his own disciples, that pretty much all of them would be killed on his behalf, uh, he doesn't pray that they'd be taken out of the world. He says, I pray that they're in it, even though they're not from here. That our, our, we have a different kingdom. Uh, our, our king is not the king of this world. Prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Now listen to this. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. They're not of this world. And Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave them here. The world's going to come after them. Protect them. And sanctify them. Purify them. By your truth. Your word is truth. We're going to get into it more in a little minute, but, but a little minute? In a minute. But sanctify them. There, there's something that happens when we get into the word of God that it purifies us from all other false teachings. We see that what God's word actually has to say, and the more we understand it and know it, um, the more we can recognize quickly what is of God and what is not of God. And Jesus prays for his disciples as he's going to die and then defeat death and be resurrected and, and ascend into heaven. He says, protect them and sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. John, after he says, we are from God, he says, and whoever knows God listens to us. Now that's not a statement I'm saying from a standpoint of, like, it sounds pretty arrogant, right? Like, whoever listens to me must be from God. It sounds, but what, what, John can say as an apostle, he has apostolic authority. And what we know is that those that walked with Jesus um, had a, a special authority on them after Jesus left to go out and be um, the main people that pushed forth the gospel and they kind of oversaw the pushing forth of the gospel. John says, whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Listen, the, the early church, Acts 2, verse 42, what has just happened is the Holy Spirit comes down on uh, God's people. There's 120 of them, and, and they start speaking in all these different foreign languages, and people are hearing them in their own language, declaring the gospel, and some people think they're out of their mind because they're hearing all these different languages, and it's, it's nuts. And then uh, Peter stands up, and he declares the gospel very clearly, who Jesus is and what that means, and 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus and are baptized that day. That's crazy. Right after that, the Bible tells us um, the, 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 the gathering of the, the first like Holy Spirit filled church looks like this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So when John says that those that listen to us, it's the apostles' teaching. He's saying that us, the apostles, that what, what they taught. Now let me tell you what they taught. They taught what Jesus told them. It's Jesus' message. It wasn't all written down yet. <laughs> okay. And what was written down and what we do have has apostolic authority in it anyway. And so what we would do is be devoted to the word of God. And that's what he's saying is that those are devoted to the actual word of God, the truth of God, the message of Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that are from 
Him. Lastly, um, he says, whoever knows God uh, listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is how. Those that, uh, those that listen, those who listen, those who have the word, those who follow after God, have the spirit of God inside of them. Um, it's how we recognize. And although we don't have the apostles speaking to us verbally, we have written for us the word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired word of God. Alive and active. L- listen to this. This is the last chunk of verses we're going to look at. 2 Timothy 3, 16. We're going to go in it into chapter 4. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's awesome. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Listen to this. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. I want to stop there. The, the best way we can know um, if, if what we're hearing presented to us as a message from God is actually from God is for us to be literate in the Bible, for us to, to really read it, understand it, study it. Um, God's given us his word. How cool is that? The creator of the universe says, like, I don't want to leave you alone just trying to figure this whole thing out by yourself, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my word, and I'm going to put my spirit inside of you so that you'll understand it, the spirit of truth that guides you into all truth. God is so awesome. He loves us so much. He doesn't just save us one day and then, like, good luck being a Christian. He saves us into a relationship with him. We were alienated and enemies, the Bible said. We read it earlier. That he reconciles us. That's a right standing of relationship. That's a bringing back into right relationship. That he brings us into relationship with himself and doesn't leave us by ourselves. That we would be in him and him in us. That we would walk together along this journey and that he gave us his word and his spirit that we could have discernment and and that we would not just go by anybody that says anything about God. but that that we would be rooted and built up in in the message of Jesus Christ that we would stay in that message of who Jesus really is, the saving power of Jesus Christ. I want to do this. Uh, One, I want to encourage you this week I think if we're not careful, sometimes we can perpetuate or push on uh, false things about Jesus. Uh, I think we can grab and, and, I don't know, especially online, I think with social media, we can just share something because it sounds some way without actually figuring out if that's what it says. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk until you have it all down 100%. I think start talking about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Start, start talking about who he is in the gospel um, and, and start learning what the Bible ha- has to say, what God has to say through his word. What we're going to do is we're going um, to close out service as a time of response. It's a time of response, responding to the goodness of God. God loves you passionately. Like the reason we know what love is, that Jesus Christ came and died for us. This time of response, I just pray that 
we would respond to whatever the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, would be putting on our hearts right now. The back of this card, the connection card, it says, my next step today. I hope you got one of these on the way in. Um, it's really just, it's a response card. It's for you to say, well, well God's drawing me to something, and I'm going to do it. And how many know that takes courage? Sometimes we, we can feel, hey, that's new for me, that's hard for me. I'm believing that the, the same God that gave you the prompting to want to walk closer to him is also going to give you the strength to move in that direction. So on the back of that card is a list of things. First one, I'm making a first-time decision to give my life to Jesus. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God or you feel far from God or you feel like you've wronged God and so you feel like there's this huge gap between and you feel like I just need to get things together before I even want to have a conversation with God, that's not the way it works. You can't do enough. There is a gap, but that gap has been bridged by Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came to his creation that God came in Christ so that we could walk over that bridge. It's through Christ we have a right relationship with God. That we don't have to, to wallow in our sins and, and, and just stay connected to that or distance from God, but that he brought us to himself by coming to us. And that God wants a relationship with you so bad that he sent Jesus. And so I, I just pray that if you're here and you haven't, start a relationship with God. The only way to do that is through the works of Jesus Christ, is putting our faith in Jesus Christ and asking him to be Lord of our life. Pray that you would do that today. Next one says, I'm recommitting my life to Jesus. I don't know what your past looks like. You do, God does. Maybe somewhere along the line you walked with Jesus for a season or maybe you said a prayer and, and, and since then there's been, um, well, maybe either you were distracted or you were just openly rebellious I Can say that in my life I've done both so that I wasn't close with God, but it wasn't because God didn't want to be close to me and wasn't there. Um, he's here right now. He, he's the one that's prompting you. He's the one. If you're feeling like, yeah, that's me, I want to be close to God, respond. And, and it's not some sort of like, well, you got to do these 84 things at all. Just have the conversation. God, thank you for drawing me back in a relationship with you. I miss you, and I know it's only through you that I get this relationship. Let's start walking this thing. I'm ready to be baptized. That's an outward expression of what's going on, on the inside. Biblically, after we've given our heart to Jesus, the old us is dead and gone, the newest has come, us has come, and we get dunked in some water to show the uh, death and the new us and that we have a hope and a resurrection with Jesus Christ. I'm interested in becoming a member of the Roots. Biblically, we're called to be a participating part of a local body, a local congregation, a, a church. Um, if that's here, that is awesome. We have membership every month. We'd love for you to come and ha have a conversation about what that looks like and then make a prayerful decision if this is the place for you. If it's not here, um, that's okay too, as long as you find a place that preaches the Bible, loves Jesus, and loves you. I want it to be here, but that's beside the point more important to me that you find a place that you fit I'd like to join a community group good because we're not built to do life on our own I'm interested in serving at the roots uh, you have gifts that glorify God and build up and strengthen the church we're going to give you a place to do that uh, but look at this line it says I will and there's a blank I don't want to pretend that those little boxes are everything that God could be putting on your heart right now ask him ask him and then the bottom is praise reports and prayer requests. Pray over these. Celebrate all of them. Uh, we're going to have prayer partners in just a moment as we worship. If you need prayer for anything, put it on the card. But also, we would love to be able to put our faith with yours and pray with you. Um, the other thing you got as we respond, this is just a, a way that we respond financially. Um, I don't want you to feel compelled or pushed, prodded into some sort of giving. What it is, is it's just uh, those that understand that God is the provider of all things, honor Him in their finances also um, as, as part of their whole life. Um, and so if you came ready to give today, um, you can do that 
to. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have this response time. Everybody's going to stand. We're going to worship together. Don't run off. It's not over until worship's over. Um, as we're worshiping, there'll be prayer partners on the side. And then right when the song's over, as we walk out, there'll be an usher at each door with a blue bucket that you can drop these in. Whew, thanks for letting me explain all that to you. And if it's your first time, if it's your first time, if you would take this back to the front desk that you came past, they have a, um, a free gift for you that we'd love to give you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. God, I pray that you would make it more and more clear what is of you and what isn't, Lord God, so that we would be clear in ourselves. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. God, I thank you that you are here right now with us and in all of those that call you Lord. God, you know where all of us are at today. God, you know the real world, tangible places that are broken in our lives. God, I pray that you would move in those spaces. God, the relationships that are broken, I pray that you would move in. God, physical bodies that are broken, I pray that you would move in. God, uh, financial or resource places, I pray that you would move in. God, I pray that you would be obvious in all situations. Yes, God. That you would reveal yourself and reveal yes. your truth in all places. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this time with you and together. In Jesus' name, ever said? Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together.